Welcome to Santa Monica Review's live online reading celebration of the spring 2022 issue. Subscribers and contributors should have received the magazine, magazine by now. If not, let me, Andrew Tonkovich, the magazine's editor, know, and I'll make sure that you receive a copy. Founded by writer and mentor Jim Crusoe as a project of Santa Monica College, we are in our 34th year of publication. Here's hoping that the fall issue reading party can be held in person at the ED Theater in Santa Monica. For now, I'll remind you that tonight's lineup includes a welcome message from two groundbreaking authors of a book I admire, A People's Guide to Orange County. Today's Orange County Spotlight is serendipitous, kind of accidental, if also perfect. In addition to work situated all over the world and in the imagination, this issue features at least two Orange County stories, and the artist whose work is featured on our cover is originally from this weird, wonderful county where I live on the unceded ancestral lands of the Achaman and Tongva peoples, and where, it turns out, so many stories are being told revised, often shared for the first time. So here's our program. We'll eschew individual intros of our five readers who will follow our community welcome by Elaine Luenik and Tui Vadon of the People's Guide. In order then, Megan Kaysan, then Parveen Parmer, Lisa Black, Garrett Salim, and concluding our longtime review pal, Rhoda Huffy, who I'm hoping is reading from her new novel out now. I'll be back to say goodbye and thanks in about an hour and 15 minutes from now after a fast paced, stylistically diverse, and to my lights, wonderfully representative literary mashup showing off just a few of the terrific writers in this new issue. Here then with a welcome from the world of research, civic engagement, revisionist history, struggle, and joyful celebration of the real stories of Orange County, my friends, Elaine, Elaine and Twee. Oh, I'm out of my camera. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Santa Monica Review Presents. We are two of the three authors of the recently released People's Guide to Orange County which is a, um, a bottom-up story of the people of Orange County. And we define people as almost everybody who's been forgotten, people of color, LGBTQ people, youth, workers, um, all sorts of different people whose stories matter. And as we worked on this book, we realized that one of the themes of all of Southern California is that people of color were pushed off the land and then pushed out of the stories that we tell about the land. It's a double displacement. It's geographic and discursive. So we're especially happy to be here welcoming you all to Santa Monica Review Presents because so many of the things in Santa Monica Reviews, like our book, are at least addressing that discursive replacement and filling in all of the gaps in how we understand who belongs here around Santa Monica, Orange County, and Southern California in general. As we've been talking to people about our book, one of my favorite pieces of feedback came from a friend who, a young friend who's in her 20s and had, um, she'd recently moved from Orange County to New York and then back to Orange County. And she told me, you know, before I read your book, I was embarrassed to tell people that I was from Orange County. And this really struck me because our book is not the typical booster thing. We are not going to tell you about the brilliance of Walt Disney. We're not going to admire the manufactured leisure of Disney World or the hyper capitalism of the Real Housewives of Orange County. We're going to tell you where the lynching trees are. We're going to tell you where the labor movements happened. We're going to tell you about, I'm sorry, my camera is being weird. Where did I go? There I am. Um, <laughs> we're going to tell you these other stories that happened here. And we didn't do it to make people feel proud. And so it actually made me feel deeply stirred to know that not the typical booster imagery is the true thing that made this young friend of mine feel proud. 
I think that is true of Santa Monica Review too. When we tell the true stories, the ones of struggle and resistance and endurance, when we tell the stories that break through the cliches and try to talk about everybody, we get to something that is much deeper than the things that the boosters thought were gonna make us proud. And so now I'm gonna hand it over to Twee to tell you more in this welcome. Thank you so much, Elaine, and hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be in community with you all, and thank you, Andrew, for inviting us to do this welcome. It's such a pleasure to be amongst writers who are really trying um, to use the literary arts to define and shape and expand what we know about our communities. Um, the thing that I really I was excited uh, about this event was that it's really a celebration, right? So much of what we've done since our books released into the world in January has been about celebrating with each other, of course, as co-authors, along with Gustavo Ariano. Um, we launched our book just um, last week, or is it two weeks ago? And it has been this incredible journey of celebrating voices that have for far too long been locked out of the stories that are told in the popular imagination about Orange County, as Elaine mentioned. Um, early on in a collaboration we had with an organization um, to preserve Orange County places, one of the points that our collaborator, co collaborator came up with was that many of these sites have been noted as sites of what they call pain and shame, right? And for me, uh, we, you know, we really were trying to think about it beyond just that story of pain and shame. It's also about resilience and about resistance and about the joy that our communities are able to cultivate despite the struggles that they've endured. Um, so recently, I just want to share a quick story about a conversation I just had last week when I was in LA for an event. Um, I was having this really fun conversation with a filmmaker who was looking for inspiration um, for a series that he wanted to pitch. And he grew up in Orange County. He grew up in Garden Grove um, and then went to college in LA and then he left. He went to Vietnam to pursue a film career. And now he's back. And he said, as he's driving through his old neighborhood recently, he could feel his body um, re respond in a really kind of um, painful and almost trauma filled way to what had occurred, what he, his memories. Um, that were placed in this, this neighborhood where he had experienced tremendous pain and violence. Um, this was the era in the 80s and 90s when there was a lot of gang activity um, in his life. But his body remembered. And then I asked him to think about how perhaps the places um, that triggered these memories, these places also remember. And so we're bringing together um, a, a different way for people to engage with the very ordinary and mundane aspects of suburban, um, the suburban that you see as you drive around Orange County, right? And, and to place the events that have happened in dialogue with each other um, and hope to encourage some conversations among communities that might have lived right next door to each other for a very long time and have not even considered the ways their histories have be been interconnected. So as much as our bodies remember um, history, I think, these places also hold so much memory. And this project has been an uh, incredible opportunity for me to um, engage with Elaine and Gustavo in their extensive knowledge of this region. And I'm, I'm happy to continue the celebration with everyone, with the public. And we hope that you'll pick up a copy of A People's Guide to Orange County and give us feedback. Thank you. And so now we, we welcome you to read A People's Guide to Orange County, but we also welcome you today to this great online event to hear from all the different authors of Santa Monica Review. So first, it, uh, first is going to be Megan Carson. Hello, um, my name is Megan Carson. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt from my nonfiction work, L.A. Ruins. Don't people visit the graves of their loved ones on Christmas? Isn't that a thing? I asked John, my husband, as we got in the car. I'm no expert on this variety of macabre etiquette. I don't know where anyone in my family is buried or otherwise stashed. But as it turns out, I was right. Forest Lawn's massive gates were open, and we drove right through them, bypassing the information kiosk, and the English Tudor style main office building. 
Up a hill, we park outside the vaguely Italian looking great mausoleum. Later, I will learn this building was inspired by the Cemeterio Monumentale di Stagliano, a cemetery in Genoa, Italy, famous for its lifelike mourning sculptures. When there isn't a global pandemic, John and I like to travel and frequently visit cemeteries in other cities. We've lurked among tombstones in New Orleans, Key West, and Edinburgh. We've stumbled over Spanish epitaphs in Buenos Aires. We've stood solemnly above the graves of Edgar Allan Poe in Baltimore and Hans Christian Andersen in Copenhagen. But somehow we've never visited the cemetery in our own backyard, the final resting place of Walt Disney and Elizabeth Taylor. Several times a week, I bike past Forest Lawn's imposing entrance, purportedly the largest wrought iron gates in the world. I admire the rolling grass covered hills within which beg to be climbed on a bicycle. I frequently wonder if it's uncivil to cycle through a cemetery. Never certain, I stick to my planned route, bound for the familiar sights of Griffith Park and its golf courses and observatory, its joggers and equestrians, travel town and its locomotive graveyard. Glendale's Forest Lawn Memorial Park is the original location of the Los Angeles era, era fewer, <laughs> Los Angeles area funerary chain, a Southern California landmark since 1906, according to its website. The weather is perfect today, or not, depending on how you like your Christmas weather. But it's a nice day for a stroll among the dead, which seems like an appropriate way to spend a holiday during the plague. Out of the car, I gaze up at the mausoleum's pointed ivory tower and think of Evelyn Waugh, the long dead British novelist whom I hadn't thought about in a long time. Waugh famously parodied Forrest Lawn in his novel, The Loved One, which I never did read. In fact, I never finished any of Waugh's novels, despite being once charged with the collection of his rarest books and ephemera. 14 years ago, when I'd interviewed for the job and confessed my ignorance of all things Waugh, my future employer suggested I start with Scoop, Waugh's satire of tabloid journalism. Though I was recently in possession of a Master of Library and Information Science degree, I'd worked as a journalist for many years, and those jobs were still on my resume. Leslie Snodgrass, a Bel Air-based rare book collector from a finance family so comically famous I've given him a pseudonym, thought Scoop would be a fitting gateway into Wallandia. He was wrong. I rode my bike to the Snodgrass interview from my squalid apartment next to a dumpster, a building not remarkable enough to have a name emblazoned on its facade like so many other mid-century Hollywood apartments. I took Santa Monica Boulevard, passing the donut shop everyone called Tranny Donuts. It's offensive now, but that word was dropped so casually then, a penny tossed in a fountain. My neighborhood was famous for its 24-hour patrol of gender-fluid sex workers, its queer vaqueros, and the trans security guard who patrolled the Del Taco. It was they, not me, who owned this corner of Hollywood where I was merely a guest. 14 years later, that donut shop is a memory. Today, a block away on the corner of Santa Monica and Highland sits the Pepto-Bismol Pink Trejo's Donuts, which is owned by the actor Danny Trejo and which features a decent selection of vegan confections. I ride on, Hollywood's grit giving way to West Hollywood's panache, rainbow flags to greet me, the bodegas and check cashing stores usurped by sidewalk cafes, juice bars, and gyms. Here, I happily cruise in the bike lane and even the police cars have rainbows on them. Finally, the iconic Beverly Hills sign comes into view, a sentinel. The sign is absurdly large and passing it means I've crossed a threshold. I'm in the land of lawns and money, the Los Angeles I grew up watching on Beverly Hills 90210. I often rode this route to UCLA when I was still in graduate school. I veer north to Sunset Boulevard, but bypass campus and continue into the ultra wealthy enclave of Bel Air, the neighborhood with the highest median income in Los Angeles County. Its denizens are also among the oldest, and they lurk behind monumental hedges. Not unlike Forest Lawn, the cemetery where some of its residents may eventually relocate, this community is gated. When I arrive at the address Mr. Snodgrass had provided over email, I have two problems. First, I am sweaty, which I should have anticipated, but somehow I never second guessed my decision to ride across town for a job interview in a mansion. The second problem is that I don't know where to lock my bike. I don't necessarily think it will get stolen from this posh cul-de-sac, but leaving a bike unlocked on the street is unfathomable in my part of town. At the gate, I ring the bell and a woman responds in Spanish-accented English. I explain that I have a job interview. 
also that I have a bicycle. A pause. Leave it on the side of the house, she says. There is a buzz and I venture into the compound. With its red tiled roof, the Snodgrass estate, estate evokes the Mediterranean, but the grounds are so lush, intentionally overgrown, that in my years working here, I'll never get a good sense of what the house actually looks like from the outside. A uniformed housekeeper opens the door and behind her stands Mr. Snodgrass, a vuncular and somewhat younger than I expected, late 50s or early 60s, around the age my father would have been. The housekeeper steps aside as he reaches out to shake my hand. Call me Leslie. Leslie guides me down a dark wood paneled hallway. It's walls lined with glass cases that are stuffed with well-worn books, the gilded imprints of their spines twinkling at me. This is a taste of the modest library that's a, that awaits us, where we will have our interview, which is filled with more wood, more glass, more books. The interior of the house, distinctly old European, portraits and battlefields painted in oil, contradicts its subtropical exterior. We sit across from each other in antique French armchairs. He's holding my resume. I'm fresh out of graduate school and I've been working part-time with special collections at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, but I have very little professional library experience. I'm not qualified for this job. Also, I'm still sweaty. You were a writer, he notes, looking down at the piece of paper in his hand. My first love was fiction, but I'd worked for years as a journalist because it seemed like the most practical way to make a living writing. Reporting was tedious, it turned out, at least the jobs and assignments I kept getting, and I'd found it exhausting to write about things that didn't move me. So I put away my pencil and did what seemed logical, applied to library school. Yes, I tell him, but it wasn't for me, a half-truth. Now I just want to surround myself with books. It sounded stupid coming from my mouth, but he smiled and took that platitude as an invitation to tell me about his collection. He specialized in rare books and manuscripts, 19th and 20th century British literature, with an emphasis on three great whites. Sir Richard Burton, my collection is second only in the world to the Huntington, W. Somerset Maugham, and Evelyn Waugh. I'd heard of Waugh and Maugham, though I hadn't read their work. I admitted as much, but Leslie wasn't phased. He asked my rate, and I named an hourly wage that seemed outrageous, surprising myself by what I'd said. $25 an hour. The number hung between us. That sounds about right. The job was part-time, but at that rate, I wouldn't need anything else. I looked around the room and saw myself working here slowly, painstakingly, for a very long time. He noticed me looking. This won't be your office, he said. Leslie led me down the hallway to another room, much smaller, with a bed and a desk. It was some kind of guest room. The glint of a knife on, a, on the desk drew my eye, but then I realized it was a letter opener, sharp at one end, baroque at the other. From the ceiling hung an incongruous glass chandelier, a wild chihuly looking thing from which sinister glass flowers dangled, dripping blood and raspberries. It was so out of place in this house, as was the white crib I noticed in the room's corner. Was that to be a book deposit? Perfect, I said. As Leslie escorted me to the door, we passed his wife, Frances, in the hallway. He introduced me as our new young librarian. I shook her hand, which was cool, and remained motionless. Nice to meet you, I said. She nodded. I studied her face and thought I saw surgery, her lips pursed and fishy, judging. Later, I would learn that she's a justice on the California Court of Appeals. A surprise. Who was judging whom? I opted for a bus ride home, hitching my bike to its front rack. On the number two, I examined Leslie's parting gifts, a copy of Waugh's Scoop, and a self-published booklet entitled Almost the Best Sir Richard Burton Collection. I scanned the text, noting Burton's opinion of women. Quite bad and cunning enough without putting such weapons as pens in their hands. The bus smelled distinctly of human waste. Across from me, a man sat holding a yellow glowing mason jar, its contents appearing suspiciously like urine. He grinned, a Cheshire cat missing a few teeth. I turned away and leaned my head against the window, watching the lawns of Beverly Hills tumble past. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Parveen Parmar, who, in a funny coincidence, was just recently a student of mine in um, a class I teach, uh, along with a lot of other people called the Wilderness Travel Course offered by the Sierra Club. Um, if you're interested, you should Google it. 
Um, and it's such a wonderful coincidence that we were both published in the same issue of the Santa Monica Review. So thank you. And I'll hand it over to Parveen. Thank you, Megan. It's a fantastic course, I can attest. So do, do take a look. Um, and thank you to, to Andrew and to the Santa Monica Review for, um, for publishing this work. I'm going to be reading um, a story of mine that's in the book, in the, uh, in the magazine called Dava. The best age for slaughter is above 15. Usually they have some curbs, some meat on them by then. The younger ones are too stickly bony. Karolika knows that the farm restaurant customers like fat. It is difficult to slaughter in the heat. The flies are everywhere and they will lay their eggs inside the girls if you do not sell them quickly. Thankfully, garlic, onion, chili, and turmeric cover a bit of rot, Kara thinks, as she begins to slice the child's neck. Outside, reddish-brown mounds of dried mud radiate heat as the afternoon settles into dusk. This time of night, the air outside is still and heavy. Tiny tornadoes of children twirl faster and faster outside their homes before dinner, giggles echoing between the bamboo and tarp of their tents. Mouthfuls of dust are kicked up by the wheels of the 4 by 4s of Angreji NGO workers racing through the narrow, uneven roads to the main artery heading north, away from their clinics, food distribution points, interviews and surveys. Rushing to get to their beachside cottages and hotels in the nearby Ferangi town before the curfew. No one in, no one out of the farm after dark. Best if they haven't eaten in some time, Kara tells Pallavi. Much easier to gut them. The belly has important meat too. Before her first kill, Kara had felt guilty. She had fed the trembling girl a rich and delicious last meal after coaxing the girl to tell her favorites, alu gobi, sag paneer, and mung dal. But dissection later was a mess, intestines full and flopping around the small bamboo hut, contents in various stages of digestion. Compassion is messy. She never made that mistake again. A spray of blood slaps the wall as Kara cuts between the young girl's collarbone and chin, one uninterrupted, deep cut from ear to ear. Pallavi can see the sparkle of her spine as her head rolls off her body. No scream passes her lips, thanks to the burfi made of sweet milk and opium paste. The girls jump at the chance to have sweets, so rare on the farm. Sometimes the opium does not work, and they noisily vomit and choke in a fountain of blood, froth, and spittle but mostly Kara gets the dose right, mostly. Kara and Pallavi unwrap the motionless girl from her sari, red with small gold and silver sparkles for the farm's men who like to pretend they can afford a wife after returning from the forests or farms, bent and broken, or after a long day of work, cutting trees or harvesting rice for the commander, or work making Angreji clothes and shoes in the factories. Kara proudly oversees Pallavi's every move. Pallavi, who worships her mother above all else, an ideal heir to her throne on the farm. In the corner by the blue tarp door that flutters with every passing gust, the saris that are not too blood-stained are tossed hastily, one on top of the other. Blood, vomit, or shit-stained saris, or those torn when, occasionally, the girls are awake enough to fight, rise in a rainbow pile on the floor next to the carcasses of their previous owners who are neatly sliced into cuts, ready for the pots next door. If not for the remnants of woman awkwardly positioned on the speckled mud floor, the room might look like a sari shop in the farm's central market. Saris of all shades, faded to other shades by the sun, dotted with sparkling plastic mirrors, hugged tightly by brightly colored thread at their edges. Each tiny mirror reflects the warped faces of corpses lying on the floor of the hut, wide-eyed and still. Once, Kara had tried to sell saris directly from the restaurant, but no one wanted to buy them from her. Goine, says uh, Kara, I'll sell these to the market stalls, and they will sell them again, and at a markup that will bring me more profit. But she hadn't offloaded her saris to the market for a few weeks now, not with the resident commander visiting the farm commander. Too many Angreji eyes, it is not safe. So the pile of clean saris rises to kiss the blue tarp ceiling, marked Regional Farm Authority in white. Kara puts down her paring knife, gets the larger machete. She hacks through the remaining neck bones and skin, liberating the girl's head from her body, praying the customers next door won't hear the banging of metal against the mud floor of the hut. 
She wraps the head in black plastic to bury it at the edge of the farm with the others. Past the kitchen, Kara and Pallavi hear various accents cry. This curry is incredible, delicious. A chorus of Angrezis sing the praises of the chef, emphatically nodding their blonde sweaty wisps over their bright red and blue eyed faces and impossibly white t-shirts triple drenched in sweat over gray green khakis. So many pockets. Kara has always wondered, what are all of those pockets for? Pallavi once asked one of them if this pocket khaki uniform was required of all Angrejis, even non-NGO, non-RFA workers. Did they wear this at dinners, at home, with their families, in the US, UK, Denmark, New Zealand? Kara walks to the doorway leading to the restaurant and peels the cloth door back. She watches the Angrezi fat rolling over their belts as they bend forward over cross legs towards their plates. They eat our girls and go for jogs through the farm in their indecent black tight things to lose weight. All that jiggling white and pink flesh. What a shame we can't cut their fat off them and serve it back to them, she thinks. Kara had initially placed yellow and pink plastic chairs in the open thatched restaurant next to the slaughterhouse, but ultimately found the Angrejis enjoyed sitting on the floor. They told her that it felt more authentic. Quick Pallavi, we must do this quietly and quickly. I did not expect this shipment today, and the Angrejis are too close. Kara walks past her other daughter, Edha, into the restaurant and turns up the radio to drown out any cries and thuds from bodies in the slaughterhouse. Pallavi is skeletal without a single curve at 14, and at first seemed to be the most fragile of Kara's children, always hanging on Kara's silvar, whining, snotty, forever wiping her nose on Kara's kameez. This brought Kara unfathomable joy. No man would ever want Pallavi. She would always be hers. As Kara sits on the floor, Pallavi hugs each leg with her strong, bony arms, first the right leg, then the left. Kara cuts into and digs around each hip joint, then the arms into the shoulder joint, first left, then right. How like large chickens people are, Kara thinks. Pallavi pulls a small gold bangle from the left arm and puts it on her own wrist. It clinks against the others. Where did she come from, Pallavi asks. Baya Samir. Baya returns to the farm once every few months, as do many of the suppliers, but he takes girls with him, so many girls, and occasionally boys. With black shirts and golden chains on their dark, broad, warm and furry chests, perched atop perfectly round, protuberant bellies, girls jump to work for him and his men daydreaming of black and white clean uniforms as maids, or maybe massaging a rich man who would then fall in love, first with their massages, then with their souls. Some know they will be sold for sex and don't care. It would be better than the farm, they reason. When they become too old or cause trouble, Samir gives them their last smoke or drink or both and sends them to Karalika. We won't have time to deal with her middle. We can do that tomorrow. Kara and Pallavi wrap the torso in black plastic and tie it tight to hide the rusty smell of blood mixed with the oniony odor of sweat and tharka that fills the room. Kara has to at least pretend to hide the girls, though neither though regular meat deliveries to the farm commander and his officers keep them quiet. Pallavi holds the woman's lower leg as Kara begins to skin from the top of the freshly dissected bloody thigh, slicing down to the knee in one uninterrupted final cut. Thanks everyone. And now I'd like to introduce our next reader, Lisa Black. Thank you, Parveen. I'll be reading from Gather Up. Since we're drinking like fish, declared Lucy, breaking free from the ubiquitous loop of worry, we all get a fish totem. Dave, you are, she fanned the golden guide, then stuck in a finger. A bass, classic big mouth bass for the silent type. They grinned at each other. Whoa, Lucy said after glancing back at the book. You're lucky I didn't point to the verso page or your totem be a crappy. Okay, new rule, yelled Rachel, startling everyone. You can't point to the same spread twice, so we're all safe from being crappy. Okay, yeah, no, answered a giggling Lucy. Next one, Malcolm is, a tarpon, what a face. Magnificent leaper, it says. Large head, tiny teeth. Look at this drawing, he's huge. 
and his leap is causing a shore break wave on a, are those reeds or no, a tree. It looks like the tree's entire root structure is exposed from the sucking wave of Malcolm the Tarpon's burst from the sea. Let's see. Malcolm snatched the book and tilted the illustration toward the pool light. At a glance, he had the image burned into his brain. Then he took over the totem bestowing. Rachel, your totem is a stone cat found under logs and stones in clear water. Perfect. Magnificent whiskers. Everyone laughed. Adipose fin contiguous with tail. Bigger laughter. Lucy's last. Ling and lakes. A swift, strong swimmer. That fits you, except you lack chin barbells. Fuck you very much. You're welcome. Ling means monkey, Lucy announced with big joy. And I'm here of the monkey. So yeah, okay, Ling I am. Ling is me. I am Ling. And so it went on into the night, alive in each other's riffing company, survivors of the great orange isolation and the plague's fever, blood sludging, and lungs of ground glass lit as they were by the potent ale and the light from the empty pool. The need to piss woke Malcolm, who didn't flush before rambling into the garage and poking around the yellow Formica workbench. He opened a wall-mounted flat cabinet, its doors unexpectedly heavy from metal files hanging and clanging there. Hand saws that had wooden handles carved with flowers hung from S-hooks in his face. One of them he thought had been on Lucy's apartment wall at some point, along with some vintage aprons of her grandmother's. She'd worn three of them in a performance she made about lucid dreaming and peeling potatoes and a snake deity. He could still visualize the poses she'd struck in the show of serpent goddesses at an Echo Park Arts Fest pre-9-11. As his eyes wandered over the bench top, the image of her in a play where she was buried up to her waist and then neck appeared in his head. It had creeped the hell out of him, so he never told her he saw it. He opened Pilon and Bustello coffee cans, then grabbed the one full of busted up chalk and headed to the backyard in his boxers. Stepping down into the shallow end, he chose the long side closest to the house so no one would catch him or see whatever he was about to draw when they took their coffees out to the patio in the morning. Whap, 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 whap. Why is my dad trying to find a beam in the wall so early in the morning? whined Lucy as she unwillingly watched her dream recede. Rap, 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 rap. Down the hall, Dave yelled at a woodpecker to fucking go away already, which overlapped with stop chopping liver in the giant wooden bowl from a thrashing Rachel. Tap, 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 tap. Malcolm groaned and rolled over on the couch, folding the pillow over his ears, making a taco skull to block out the clacking of a manual typewriter and his mother cursing his older brother for doing a report on Switzerland instead of Peru. Why doesn't he type his own damn report like I had to? The smell of coffee lured them one by one to the kitchen and they wafted onto the shady patio with their mugs. A few sips in, grins began to crack their sad sacks. Rachel had bartered a website overhaul for the big drip when the shelter in place began and the coffee house survived, paying her in sublime fair trade beans. They acknowledged their great good fortune in drinking yet another luxury beverage with glances shooting from crinkly crow's feet. Everyone cracked up recounting how the sound of the neighbor hammering had infiltrated their hangover dreams. With Rachel adamant, she smelled onions frying. Soon the sun rose high enough above the house to spill bright heat into the backyard, which drew the lizards out to do their push-ups. At some point in the afternoon, they shifted from coffee to ale, then spent a long time making a simple pasta feast with herbs and veggies Dave had grown. Bellies full, they resumed to their positions on the patio for dozing, dragging furniture back toward the eaves for shade. As the late afternoon shadows crept toward them, Malcolm disappeared into the house. Shortly after a toilet flush, 
They heard the blasting dum 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 da 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 that opens Rock Lobster. Everyone got up, dancing with abandon, transported back to 1978 when playing the 45 conjured up an instant dance party that kept going as long as they replayed the hit. The four olds pony twisted and jerked. They shimmied and slammed, gyrating and hippie hippie shaking all over the yard, adjusting their moves to the various aspects of their decrepitude. They had snaked out single file beyond the pool along the slim stretch of cement at the edge of the drop off when Rachel stopped short and froze. Lucy crashed into her then followed her friend's gaze into the pool. Dave and Malcolm backtracked to see what had them transfixed. The four of them stood, panting. They saw a tarpon rise mightily, its leap causing a breaking wave to head to shore. Riding that wave on the body of a stone cat was a magnificent monkey, lengthy and blue with its back leg planted on the adipose fin where it merged with the tail and its front leg on the stone cat's head. The fishes swept back whiskers exuding speed and power. They were headed straight for the majestic maple syrup goddess. The monkey already stretched out one arm in offering while its other paw checked its balance on the wave face. The tarpon gazed at her royal highness as if this jump was the singular accomplishment of its destiny. The deity was arrayed in maple leaf gown and crown, accessorized by stiletto swim fins. Her hair rose like kelp from its hold fast and seahorse tails curled around her spiky heels. A creepily beautiful look down swam from the pool light toward the goddess's left hand, regarding her disapprovingly while begging for a handout. Cruising above in the watery sky was a frilly cabazon, emitting a banner of words too small to make out. So Lucy climbed down the deep end ladder and got low enough to read, do what you gotta do and stay fly. The jig was up. She and Malcolm had read Michael Chabon's Telegraph Avenue a gazillion times, as recently as the quarantine. She turned to look up at him, inhaling to yell, j'accuse, but was checked by a swarm of vertigo, as if peering down at rushing cars from a freeway overpass. Inside her head came the rhythmic clopping of clogs approaching in slow steps that had haunted her earliest childhood. The pool's long dormant filter began to flap. Its sucking sound hurt like a bone biopsy. Lucy clutched the rungs and barely managed to beach herself on the pool deck in a heap. She looked back at the mural just in time to see the blue monkey kick out of the wave and leap onto the shallow end steps. Here, I am here, here, it began. You don't know, I know, you don't know who I am. You want me to tell you who, 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 who I am? It charged ahead without pause. I will tell, tell, tell it, tell it now. Ride, ride, she told me. She said, ride, ride the dolphin, mount it. Mount the dolphin and ride. Me, a minor character, but I can ride a dolphin through time. The monkey scurried and clamored all over the steps as if an actor whose only lines were a lone monologue in a three hour play. I am descended from the blue monkeys depicted on the fresco, buried and buried under Thera's demise. Kraboom, crack a boom, crack a boom, 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 I say. Then it held for just a beat. But I was already astride the dolphin. My goddess, she told me to mount and ride the wakes of waves of the destruction of Thera for a thousand and a thousand and a thousand years to this very drought to hear here to this empty pool, meet here, gather, gather ye all at this empty drought, gather, gather, here, 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 here at this very empty pool. Who would bet against this? Ride and ride and ride, gather up. Throughout the uncanny speech, the blue monkey's body had vibrated with Tesla coil intensity. Now, its pronouncement halted it regarded them silently. 
buzzing with a low level wattage that animated its tail. No one moved or spoke until finally Lucy broke the spell. But we're already gathered. The monkey grabbed its tail to ponder. Then my work is done, it declared. And in a flash, it spun and dove into the filter opening, the tip of its tail, the last that was seen of it. They all watched the filter flap. Very early the next morning, after a long stupefied night, each of them staggered into the kitchen in search of coffee. Lucy was the last to make an appearance, but she was fully dressed. We're hiking to Nawal shores she announced, the shapeshifter's beach. It's the best possibility to find the blue monkey. I don't wanna to wait to see if he'll return because obviously he won't. The talking monkey was key. She'd known it the moment she woke up. They had to find it. Where that ling was, the goddess soon would be. Malcolm swallowed his impulse to remind her the little rogue said to gather at the pool. They ate breakfast, pooped and peed, filled dinged up Nalgene bottles with water, made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and tossed them into backpacks, then tied hoodies around their hips. Some stretched, did Qigong. Sunscreen was applied. They took off on the three mile hike, making sure their orange wristbands were visible. No dumping, drains to ocean, stencils cautioned at every storm drain. Though nothing was said, they each figured that's how the blue monkey was traveling. Who would bet against this? Lucy asked herself, holding the monkey. What do I expect to see there? She wondered. Would the monkey's goddess appear, also riding a dolphin? But weren't those fresco women or priestesses or goddesses or whatever they were, all destroyed when the warmongers used the volcanic eruption to seize power once and for all? No, she resolved. The little trickster wasn't lying. She was herding her friends to the shapeshifter's beach in hopes of ushering the deity to this wreck of a century. Lucy was waylaid from declaring herself the queen of her own delusional cabal by the Capistrano mission bells which began ringing as they crossed the railroad tracks, then followed the bike path along the gaping storm channel due west. Thank you. And up next, we have Garrett Salim. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Garrett Salim. Uh, I will be reading today from a thing called Orange County Gothic. Uh, it appears in the Santa Monica Review. I should get through about half of it. A broke 30-something in khakis and a red polo met me at a Saturn on the lowest level of a Target parking structure. He told me his mother left him the car just before she died of leukemia, and it was mine if I pulled four of his teeth during his lunch break. Even in the flattering darkness of the parking garage, I saw why he wanted to get rid of it. The paint was eaten away along the roof, and inside, the AC made the summer air taste like plastic. His teeth were rotted, and no matter what he did, he couldn't get rid of the smell. He sat in the passenger seat with both hands on a strawberry milkshake, the beads of moisture nesting between his fingers. On swollen days, the teeth were painful, but it was worse than that. It made him dream of his mother, and in dreams, she was always sick. He said that once the teeth were out, he could stop associating her with decay and finally accept that like the teeth, what was now missing was gone for good. I just want a clean break, he said, in normal dead mother dreams, the kind his father was having. I turned on the cabin light and took out my dental tools. I asked if he ever went to targets and other towns dressed for work just to direct people to the wrong aisles. Patients need jokes, even bad ones, and of out of all the truisms of dental school, that one stuck with me because it showed empathy. He laughed to avoid answering as the seat leaned back, and as I cleaned the scalpel, he talked about learning to, to drive half a lifetime ago, sitting where I was sitting now, back and forth all summer on a service road along a dry creek when everything felt ahead of him, and then he just fell to pieces. 
Later that afternoon, I parked the Saturn near the faraway part of the cemetery where they used to bury the suicides. It was my day off, but I was picking up my coworker Claude to go drinking. Last winter, Claude recognized me from our days in dental school. He asked what I'd been up to other than growing a beard and offered to take me to lunch. I accepted because I wasn't exactly busy. I had been out of money for some time, working Gorilla Dental Procedures via three separate apps. I worked in Walmart parking lots and between dumpsters and fast food alleys, on drivers in the back seats of their fareless Ubers, and on delivery cyclists who put their insulated backpacks on the ground but never left their bikes. During this difficult period, I further developed my theory of dental empathy, an empathetic transfer of energy resulting in a painless dental procedure without the use of anesthesia. I wanted to write a book on the subject, but my mental notes were scrambled by the pristine rod of the suburbs. At the Denny's, I ordered hot water with lemon. It's all up here, I said with an index finger to my skull, but it just disintegrates on the way down to my hands. Like Lou Gehrig, Claude said the iron horse. He set aside the water and assured me that I could order whatever I wanted. This idea of yours, he said, it's too radical for Orange County. You need to get out. And to do that, you're going to need steady work. The waiter came and took my order, to which Claude added a side of biscuits and winked at me. A year before, I was fired from my last dental practice, which focused on pediatric dentistry. I wondered if Claude had Googled me when he first saw me sleeping on that bench. The misreported circumstances were easy to find. Suffice it to say, the practice was very conserv conservative by any measure, and they couldn't stand the slightest whisper of change. Claude sh uh, shook twin packets of sugar into his coffee. I have some work for you if you want. It's not much, but it could help you get out of here soon, write your book in the city. And uh, who knows, maybe you'll get to open your own practice around it, Claude said. I grew up there and everyone is into that witchy shit. Let me tell you, LA loves sympaths. He offered me assistant work, helping him fix up open casket teeth at Nostalgia Meadows, a full service mortuary that also facilitated estate sales. Mostly he paid me to listen while he removed a tooth or two so the face would sit a certain way. When Claude knew the deceased, he kept the tooth as a memento, adding it to what he called the family collection, which included many of the famous teeth in the American dental record. Teeth spat from JFK onto the streets of Dealey Plaza, Will Gable's incisors from before he was remade into Clark, dog teeth from the St. Bernard who played Lady Beethoven in Beethoven's second. This asshole never smiled a day in his life, Claude said while descaling the maxillaria of his high school principal. You can tell because it looks so unnatural. The head was turned toward me and the face looked like a rubber mask yearning to slip off. Claude had just tucked a premolar into the breast pocket of his button-up. He referred to the embalming process as movie magic. We were step four in the process between bathe and massage and set the face. And while the mortician was at Subway, we passed through the black box of subsequent steps into the adjacent room. There was the principal in the brown suit with the bird, ling, ling, uh, the bird wing lapels he wore to Claude's graduation. His face made up like he was getting married on a game show. Can you believe that's the same guy, Claude said? No fucking way. It doesn't even look like him. That's movie magic, baby. Part of the higher-end funeral package included an option for a memorial necklace made with a tooth from the recently departed dipped in gold leaf, but nobody ever opted in. I told Claude that I had read all failures were failures of marketing, and he told the mortician who gave us the booth next to the in-memoriam charitable giving table. Neither was ever occupied. Right before the next funeral Monday morning, Claude brought in a picture of Ryan Reynolds wearing Scarlett Johansson's golden tooth on a chain. I thought they broke up, said the dead man's brother later that day. He seemed upset about it. He was a few drinks into the morning process, steadying himself on a cresting stack of anti-deforestation brochures. Only because he lost the necklace, I said, and I took his hand and patted it. Another aphorism, sometimes the best advertisements are veiled threats. If I had a woman like that, he said with a sweep of his hand, I'd never lose anything again. We all lose something sometime, Claude said, or someone, I said, and presented his brother's tooth dipped in gold and strung on a chain. But it's rare that we get to carry an important piece of them around forever. He bought the tooth necklace for his mother, who was nearly blind and required something more tactile than a black and white portrait to remember much of anything. We watched her in the corner in a chair upholstered in the same wire wool blue as the carpet, her eyes wide and milky looking out into an empty room of her own interior, 
working the tooth necklace be between her fingers like a rosary. By the time we reached the principal's funeral, I was spending slower days perched over a small table with a jeweler's loop and a dental scaler etching initials and dates of life into the gold surface of every tooth I extracted from my side work as a backseat dentist. Claude's hands were too shaky for that kind of precision, and he arrived one morning with a large glue stick, and by lunch the booth was fully collaged with picture pictures of celebrities wearing each other's teeth. Get more paparazzi candidates, I said. They tend to look more somber. After fulfilling our one tooth obligation to the mortuary, we were selling four or five teeth per funeral. And in six weeks, I made enough for a big first printing of my book once I had the headspace to write it. So I set $100 aside for future moving expenses and spent the rest so fast, I avoided Claude until our next funeral, where we sold five more. After that, I relaxed a little. We need to get one of those slow panning PowerPoint slideshows and set it to some Sinatra. Claude said, take this thing to the next level. He was looking one-eyed through a rectangle formed by his fingers and humming fly me to the moon. Claude's grandfather had been the Hollywood dental surgeon who gave Joan Crawford her cheekbones. In the chapel after work, we put the morning in progress sign on the door where we drank beer out of the body fridge and watched Johnny Guitar, a Gnostic Western portraying man banishing God from creation in retaliation for sexual desire. Claude's family had the kind of money that protected him from failure until his late 20s when he entered dental school on his last name and exited as soon as anything was asked of him. His mother was the on-call dentist at a major investment bank. She had a corner office on a high floor with two walls of ice blue glass and a dentist chair upholstered in leather over the skull of a single African elephant fashioned by a well-known Dutch artist famous for using recycled materials. Claude and his mother bickered like two comedians trapped performing a popular routine they could never escape. It was their way of saying, I'm sick of how much I love you. And when they wanted to say anything else, they fought about money. Claude was thrown out on his ass, but never fully cut off. Each time he landed on his floor mattress with a view of the ocean from a flattering angle. In those in-between moments, he became so aware of himself, shot through with vulnerability in that strange passage from guest house to rent-free apartment, where he spent nights dreaming of getting even. The most common nightmare is having all your teeth fall out, I said one night on his balcony. A big part of my book is about finding what terrifies people and how they'll give you anything for even an inch of separation from it. Empathy is largely about understanding fear. I think dentists can be on the front lines of that. What do you think my mom is afraid of, he said. And in the moonlight, I looked out over the bone-colored breakers curving north because it felt like something stirred, something imperceptible floating toward us far out of the shifting wind as the distant refinery glowed from its fractalized inferno. And I told him she feared losing everything, the same as everyone else. Claude, uh, Claude saw the Saturn and asked to take his Audi. He drove us to a bar not far from work where the dim green light made everyone look like marooned corpses off a shipwreck. His mother had kicked him out of the guest house for the final, final time. He called her during his lunch break to tell her he bought a gun just to see what she said. Turns out she hates guns, he said. Claude reached into his pocket and I expected him to pull some huge pistol, but his phone lit up and he paid me my share for two weeks work. Every time I took money from Claude, he asked the same question. Do you have enough yet? Almost there, I said. I still have some things to take care of. He never asked what they were, as if he knew they were nothing, and asking would only make me realize it. I only want to move up there when I'm really ready to go, I said, ready to write the book, ready to, you know, everything. We got a good thing going here anyway, Claude said. Look around. Can you imagine what we could do with these faces? He started using the bar as a transitionary phase from the mortuary to the world after he caught himself picturing how a Tinder date would look between steps four and five of movie magic. Now we came here to get it out of his system before the weekend. The heat wave wandered in from the long evening, piece by piece as the door opened, stacking up around us. Claude glistening in his phone screen as the melted cold from our drinks cooled over the bar and we drank until it was in our laps, while the music played slow and thick like it was released by a valve. He was texting his mother. He wanted to go shoot out the guest house window over the garage and see how long it would take her to notice. She doesn't even use that room. It's my room. She never even goes near it, he said. Man, this sucks. Rich people are disgusting. I told him to text her how he was feeling, that communication was the key to maintaining healthy familial relationships. 
he hadn't looked up since. When I met Kathy, Quad's mother, her hair was so blonde it was almost white. She looked like a corporatized Catherine Deneuve. Claude took the three of us out to a new American bistro for his birthday. She had written a memoir on being a woman in a male-dominated profession, and Claude believed that if two writers simply met, they could help each other in some vague but very important way. He introduced me as his co-worker, the Buddhist dentist he told her about. I told her it wasn't Buddhist dentistry, but dental empathy, a simple shift in focus that incorporated some Eastern religion, but focused mainly on a rejection of the doctor's ego personified in favor of understanding the patient and not only their personhood, but as a set of experiences. Her lip curled, and with a kind of pity, she told me that Zen Buddhism wasn't any better than Christianity and had provided cover for the Japanese atrocities in Manchuria. Maybe I didn't explain it well, I said. Her head was already turned away with finality. I was sure that if she heard me out once I gathered my thoughts, she would at least be impressed by my initiative. Planning on writing a book should be enough to impress anybody, especially if it was going to change the conversation or at least lead to the establishment of a successful dental practice. I felt like telling her I came from nothing, that I was the first person in my family to think very hard about much of anything. I excused myself and passed through a door labeled as a restroom, but it led to the bar next door where the blue lit bodies were packed tightly along the counter with dozens of crooked arms moving from one mountainous thorax with shadowed faces watching me from its folds and ridges. The bathroom burned a dull orange mirage at the far corner, and as I moved behind the grotesque form, I recognized the embedded faces as high school classmates of mine, and I felt the air heat between me and their half-turned profiles, the pathway elongating and their mumbled words about the misreported incident at the conservative dental practice and the three dental mental apps and everything that had gone wrong with me and probably everything that would. Was this hell? The cold water ran down my face, cupped from the hot faucet, and when the door opened, I locked myself in the stall. I summoned my positivity visualization practices. I focused on my breathing, the feeling of my body on the toilet, and I pictured Kathy in a hardly buttoned sundress laying in a park somewhere near a lake, pages and pages of my brain spread out before us like a cerebral picnic. These ideas are incredible, babe, Kathy said. You just need me to help you organize them a little. Claude put his phone down on the wet bar with such force that it snapped me out of my vision. Tonight was the end. We would go to his mother's house to collect his most important belongings, and then he would disappear from her life. Come with me, he said. I wanted to go home because I heard a version of this every Friday. He held up his phone and showed me that he blocked his mother and told me I was being a shitty empath. Any empathetic person will tell you that empathy requires the occasional recharge, I said. I found you sleeping on a bench, he said, splashing his palm hard under the bar and rattling the glass. How's that for empathy? A couple on a bad first date looked over, and I knew we would be blamed. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you so much. Uh, and next up, we have uh, Rhoda Huffy. Take us back. Thank you, Garrett. My name is Rhoda Huffy, and uh, I'm going to read from my novel, 31 Paradiso, which will be out next month. So uh, this is not the beginning. What you need to know is that the main character, Francine, has just moved to Venice Beach for, for a fresh start. And she's visiting her family uh, a little ways away, family of origin. The entire family of origin is gathered having dinner. And uh, the entire family loves religion and real estate. Okay. <laughs> The Didwells <clears throat> were disappointed in their children. Not that they didn't love them, of course. With the family seated at the Didwell table, set with the good china, you could feel sin pushing to get in through the windows of the 100-year-old Victorian, the Didwells' pride and joy, especially the north wall of small glass panes that looked out on the stunning San Gabriel Mountains proof of the existence of God and his judgment against all men. In the grand three-story house God had provided, no longer poor, now rich, the adult Didwells still worried. Their children, preacher's kids, lacked the Holy Ghost fire that Luella and Clarence had discovered separately when they converted, Mr. Didwell being saved out of the Lutheran church, misses under the preaching of the great Amy Semple McPherson. 
They caught fire and kept going. Mr. Didwell, now retired, still preached occasionally, while Mrs. Didwell had stopped preaching entirely since the Sunday in the pulpit when she lost her timing and left Hezekiah dangling from a tree, 40 minutes over 12 noon. But oh, what a life of adventure they had had. Their children felt pale in comparison. So in their secret heart, the Didwells were dissatisfied. All around them, other preachers and their wives had children who grew up to do great things for God, go as missionaries to the dark continent, or pastor large churches, or become president of the Bible college. While the Didwell children dangled here on earth doing nothing outstanding for the kingdom, not one was a powerhouse, not one. In their Christmas letters, they were vague. Francine still lives an hour away, Eileen continues to use the voice God gave her as a funeral singer. Bunny loves her work in the field of Christian psychology and often takes additional classes at UCLA where some of her teachers are communists. Noah lives just up the street. Be ye perfect even as I am perfect, Mr. Didwell said now while he waited for his sweetheart, Mrs. Didwell, who had returned to the bedroom and was still getting ready behind the door, even as steam rose off the dishes. When someone's stomach growled, they all looked at Noah. Mr. Didwell tapped his Bible. Only sinners called him Mr. Didwell, mostly tenants in his six apartment buildings. Although he was a preacher, he was a finan financial genius. The saved called him reverend or brother. Monrovia was a battleground and the devil seemed to be winning. Noah's stomach growled louder. Hungry faces stared toward the bedroom. How go the apartment, said Mr. Didwell. I got all the rent checks, said Francine, and all the Didwells praised God. Apartment talk was like Esperanto, a language both sinners and Christians could speak. Her siblings jeered at the Venetian method of collecting rent, envelopes and bamboo trees, but Mr. Didwell found it solid. In nine years, despite the wattles on his neck, despite his head collapsing a little forward on his spine, her father's spiritual powers seemed to have expanded. His eyes burned upward with a fierceness like the prophet Moses. At the table, Francine's muscles screamed for movement. Let's just pray and eat, said Noah, who could no longer abide waiting for Mrs. Didwell. He possessed a high metabolism and consumed enough for three men. He was long and lanky and named for the only man who obeyed God during the time of the flood. Scientists were still discovering evidence that proved the Bible true, word for word. They bowed their heads and Noah gave thanks to God for almost everything despite his hunger, more pious by the moment while his stomach argued with him. Mysterious shuffling sounds came through the crack beneath the bedroom door while Noah, in his prayer, began a chorus about goodness and light. Of all the children, he was the most fundamentalist, a kind of scholar who had taught himself Latin and Greek. The oldest sister, Eileen, the movie star, winked, and down the table, the youngest, Bunny, made a list of things to do at work. At 19, Eileen had been a siren who drove men insane. At the Didwell table, the prayer hurtled on. Mr. Didwell's face contorted with his private supplications to God, mostly to be purified of sin. Amen, said Noah, the only man who did what God said. Hands grabbed food from all around the table. By this time they were ravenous and the dining room was filling with the satisfying noise of serving spoons on empty plates when the bedroom door opened, all sound stopped. Praise God, said Mr. Didwell sonorously like a trumpet. All eyes followed him, his. My girlfriend has arrived. Indeed, Mrs. Didwell now stood in the bedroom doorway where she compelled everyone's attention. Mother, father, Noah have stood. You have shown a great example by your long union, still as filled with romance as the day you met. It's a model we children can emulate. And has this food been prayed for, Mrs. Didwell interrupted? 
The senior Didwells had recently begun to lose their hearing, a family weakness on both sides, and spoke in voices that made the rooms they lived in quite loud. Mr. Didwell looked sheepish while his girlfriend continued walking slowly, somehow taking command of the room despite her peripheral neuropathy, her charisma undiminished, preaching or no preaching. Her face had grown beautiful in the nine years Francine had been gone, wrinkled but with good bone structure no one would have guessed was there. Nobody chewed. All sat still, hands in their laps, except for Noah, who had risen fully to pull Mrs. Didwell's chair out. At the dinner table, standing, hand raised, Mr. Mrs. Didwell waited for an answer. We did say grace. Clarence cupped one hand to his ear. When she reached down to test a piece of turkey, the dark meat, it had panache, as if from this time forward, all the Didwells would eat with their fingers. She brought the morsel to her mouth. She chewed. She waited. Tastes about half prayed for, said Mrs. Didwell. Francine burst out laughing and Noah pulled his mother's chair out. All the Didwells ate and talked about the price of real estate and about God's hand in said real estate. God was interested. All the Didwells loved to eat. They didn't drink. They didn't smoke. They didn't have sex, theoretically. Christ can't come until every man, woman, and child has heard the gospel, Noah affirmed. Francine, said Mrs. Didwell, utterly evil, were you in church on Sunday? Yes. Everything arrested. Mrs. Didwell knew Francine was lying, and Francine knew her mother knew, and her mother knew she knew her mother knew. Mrs. Didwell slowly put half a green bean into her mouth. These green beans had been soaked in brown sugar. She enjoyed it and swallowed. Where? If you pretended hard enough something was real, it wasn't lying. You had to believe it. Francine imagined offering envelopes, hymn books, a woman in a blue hat. She said, I went to church in West Los Angeles, full gospel. I see, said her mother. What did the preacher preach about? Francine pictured it. The sin of pride. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Mrs. Didwell leaned forward. Did they speak in tongues? It was a trick question, and Francine knew better than to say yes. She was backslidden, but had once known the truth. That speaking in tongues came after dark, late if it was summer. Instead of answering, Francine pounced. Mother, sing the La La song. In slow motion, Mrs. Didwell's features became fluid. La 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 la, she sang. Francine thought about the nine years she had been absent. La 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 la. Mrs. Didwell was still singing at the table in Monrovia because memory only takes a second. Francine and her mother were just alike, almost the same person. Each one loved fun and was good at it. When Mrs. Didwell finished the song, conversation flowed. Bunny's promotion, thanks to Jesus. The funeral the next day where Eileen planned to sing the Lord's Prayer. She had been the high school choir sensation. And the year she sang the solo at assembly, her whole skirt had fallen off on stage and the microphone, at the microphone, which only increased her popularity. Noah mentioned that the Universal Joint was going on his station wagon the one he used to do repairs on his apartment building. What kind of joint, said Mrs. Didwell, still eating? The universal joint, Noah called out, hands cupped to make a trumpet. What's that, said Mr. Didwell, nearly shouting. They were both losing their hearing at an alarming rate. Please pass the fucking mashed potatoes, said the honey voice of Eileen. The deaf Didwells kept eating. All the children paused in shock. Their hearts stopped. Never in 25 years had the walls of this house witnessed a cuss word. Although hands passed dishes and silver clinked, the table had become electrified, magnetized, dramatized, like a large barge floating out on the open sea. The Didwell children had never been allowed to swear, not the big words, not the little ones, and no derivation and no abbreviation. God watched constantly. 
Their eyes widened while they waited to be struck by lightning, a wild excitement rising in them. I'd like some goddamn green beans, said Bunny. What was that? Mrs. Didwell's eyes narrowed slightly. I said I'm gobbling green beans, Bunny yelled, her face red, hysterical. I don't see you gobbling, Mrs. Didwell looked around the table. Shitty turkey, please, said Francine, participating in the new freedom. Around the table, the swearers felt like they could fly, and although Noah kept his mouth shut, his eyes sparkled with the danger. On natural speed, all their muscles felt spectacular, and they couldn't stop laughing. Mrs. Didwell ate her turkey, her eyes narrow, watching her four children. Thank you. I'd like to just take a moment um, to thank all the readers, but especially to thank Andrew. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about him. He does so many things. He's founded a magazine. He edits a magazine. He's edited another book. Um, but I want to say, too, that Andrew is an amazing writer, and he always showcases other writers, and I think he should get himself up here sometime. <laughs> uh, this is what a writer he is. I, yesterday, it was very hot in Venice, and so I was walking my dog, and I was miserable. It was just too hot. And I'd been thinking about Andrew, and so he has this uh, story, a novella called Keeping Tahoe Blue, um, from his book, Keeping Tahoe Blue and Other Provocations. And uh, I love that story. So I imagined that I was swimming underwater in Lake Tahoe and it was cool and wonderful and I could feel, I felt like a shark. And um, I, could, I could feel exactly what it felt like. And the odd thing is, I don't know how to swim. So <laughs> I don't, but I feel like I know how to swim because of Andrew's story. Uh, it just does that to you. He, he really, um, if you haven't read Andrew Konkovich, go get something and read him. And um, I think you should be on one of these shows. Thank you so much, Andrew, and all the readers. Thank you, Rhoda. That was very naughty of you, but <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, folks, that was uh, some piping hot slices of the zeitgeist as we uh, serve them up here at Santa Monica Review. And I have to say, that was a lot of damn fun and those were amazing pieces if I don't say so myself and I do say so a lot um Rhoda's book looks like this I've got a advanced copy it'll be out soon and Twi Gustavo and Elaine's book uh looks like this I couldn't be prouder to be associated with this journal and with these excellent people and I want to just give a special shout out to engineer Rob Rudolph for uh, keeping this whole uh, crazy rodeo together, to Linda Sullivan at Santa Monica College and to our supreme literary patron, Saint Don Gerard of uh, Santa Monica College. Uh, you can tell your friends that this recorded version will be up on uh, our channel in a couple of days. Thank you so much for purchasing a ticket. It means a lot to a little literary magazine for subscribing, uh, for gifting it uh, to friends if you buy some copies elsewhere. We'll be at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, uh, masked and playing it safe, but uh, passing out for free about 2,000 copies of the journal as part of the college's mission of engaging the literary arts and encouraging civic literacy and a community and Holy cow, I hope we actually get to all see each other in person at the next reading in fall in October at the uh, ED Theater in Santa Monica. I'm very grateful and uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Bye.